enjoyed, um, especially Diana's French horn today. How many enjoyed the French horn? Uh, so you know, many of you know me, I love music, and I understand this is a gift from God. It's a gift from God. Music brings us, it makes us suggestible. That's why music can be dangerous, because it makes us suggestible. But it opens our hearts to Him. And I'm so grateful for the different tones and the qualities of music. And, and she's a really good French horn player. You know, I mean, it's my humble opinion, but for what it's worth. Um, she was also, we didn't get the accordion this time, but that's okay. I guess we can't have everything. So, uh, but thank you. Thank you, Donna. It was so wonderful. And we got to play together finally. So, there we go. Okay. Um, today, I want to talk a little bit. Like my message is called Keep It Simple. Keep it simple. And uh, the challenge of any organization is to stay on task, including churches, is to stay on task. And the, the church, we must remember who we are and what we are to do. Pretty simple. It's, this is what we need to do to remember our primary mission. And it must understand what are the things, how do we accomplish this mission? And the short letter to Titus, Paul uh, outlines clear, clearly and practically how to achieve this mission, what the church needs to do to be effective. Uh, Titus 1, 1 through 2, he, he opens his letter. Uh, I have been sent to proclaim faith to those God has chosen and to teach them to know the truth that shows them how to live godly lives. This truth gives them confidence that they have eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised them before the world began. Faith and truth. Simple, simple words. Well, simple to remember, hopefully. Faith and truth. Faith. God has chosen us. He has saved us through Jesus. And often Paul uses the word faith, he, he uses the term endurance along with the word faith, this word endurance. And, and uh, really, the idea is we don't need to take control from him, and that's where the faith comes in, when we allow God to do what he's going to do and not try to control our own lives. Endurance is when you keep going, even though everything around you or everything within you says, stop or turn. That's endurance. And, and Paul often links the two together when we think about faith, because faith is certainly, uh, we can't see, we can only experience. And God has made this promise, it was something he was telling his disciples as he was teaching them, you know, what's going to happen, but they couldn't quite, they couldn't quite figure it in their heads, and in fact, how many of them left him when he went to the cross? Did they have endurance? Well, certainly he came back to them and, and they, they responded. But this endurance thing and this faith thing is very interesting for me. And we, Mary and I, uh, we were just in uh, Morocco. And so that was a lot of fun for us, just a couple days. And uh, we, we took her sister, or we went along, I don't know how to put it, uh, with her sister and her husband. And uh, we, I reserved a place in the old city of Fez. Anyone been to Fez, Morocco? Okay, it's an old, old city, all right. Um, we, we, we were in, in, the, uh, in the, right in the old city, the, the place was highly recommended, and it really looked nice on the website. Now, imagine, if you will, an old Moroccan city. Dusty, crowded alleys, very busy, lots of activity going on, more than even here in Moldova. Okay, all the different activity, kids running around. And uh, it's, it's just like you've seen in the movies, right? You know, you think of a, a northern, North African city, that's just the way it was. And I'm gonna tell you that I'm just about up for everything. And this is one of those times where I had to remind myself of that. <laughs> I'm up for everything, okay? So, uh, and we turned out that it turned out that maybe Mary's sister and brother-in-law aren't as adventurous as we thought 
because they were really nervous as the, the guy was leading to us to the hotel in the old city. Uh, I think they were deciding if they could trust Keith. That's what I think they were thinking. Because I'm wondering if I can trust this guy who I'm, who's leading us. You know, you see that you're the owner, okay, and the taxi took us here and we met and we gave him money and we'll see what happens with us now. And um, as I was pretty nervous, the alley was dirty, there was no indication of the reward that awaited us. No indication at all of the reward that awaited us. They opened a the door and the house was stunning. It was as the website described. It was amazing. The, the, the gentleman that ran the place was incredible. Just fantastic. It elevated our trust, right? We're like, okay, all right, it's gonna be okay, you know. Um, then we had to eat and our host took us to this other alley that, I mean, you kind of go, okay, should we keep falling or should we flee? You know, what should we do here? And uh, into a door that actually would make us hesitate. I, I, I guarantee that most of you would not walk through this door if, if you weren't following somebody. But we had faith in our host at this point. The reward was a rooftop view with the most amazing Moroccan food I've ever tasted. I haven't tasted a lot of Moroccan food, <laughs> all right? I assume it's really good Moroccan food. I will just tell you that I was really happy with the food we ate. It was amazing. And there we are on a cool night looking over the old city. It's just as what we imagine a movie should be, or, a, you know, this is Morocco, all right? Never mind the McDonald's and everything else you see. What we see are the old city. That experience never would have come if we had not had faith in our host. And every indication that we had was what? That we shouldn't. But we followed him anyway. See, faith is a decision. It's a resolution to follow. That's what faith is. It's a resolution to follow. It's not even a feeling. Because my feelings at that time were... Ner nervous, okay? It wasn't a feeling. It was a decision to follow, and that's what faith is. We follow God. We follow Jesus. It's faith. It's a resolution, a decision to follow Him. Now, naturally, such a faith is accompanied by truths to give our experience fullness and to protect us. These truths protect us. Now, our, our, our host and friends, he had truths. He was insistent that we follow some precautions. Uh, he said, not all street food is safe. Okay? And that's a good precaution. Now, in our hunger, we could have ignored him. And it probably would have been disappointing results, if not catastrophic results. Instead, and here's the thing, he couldn't go with, he said, you have to wait. I'm sorry, you'll have to wait. I'll take you to a restaurant, but it's going to be 30 minutes. Can you wait? Well, we had to discipline ourselves to wait, even though we were super hungry, until he was available, until he could take us to this restaurant. Waiting is hard, isn't it? Waiting is hard. But that's a part of faith. That's a part of following. If we follow those truths, there's a reward for us. Note that Paul says in verse 2, God does not lie. In Crete, where Titus was located, many followed this God, uh, Zeus. And uh, there would be those in the church who would actually bring their own version of who God is into the church. Basically, their experience was Zeus. Now, the problem with Zeus was that he was a liar. He was capricious. He was whatever he he would try to get away with whatever he could. That was our understanding and teaching about Zeus. So they began to attribute some of that to Jesus, the teachers did, that were involved in the church. And Paul tells us that God does not lie. I mean, by saying that, he's declaring the true God is different. 
And he's also exposing the corruption of the teachers, all in one, in one statement. Those that have compromised the truth. Paul tells us that if we follow the truth, our effectiveness grows. Just as simple as that. So what is the truth? Well, I'm going to jump over to Titus 3, 4 through 7, because he reads this, he has this beautiful poem. When God our Savior revealed his kindness and love, he saved us, not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ our Savior. Because of his grace, he made us right in his sight and gave us confidence that we will inherit an eternal life. God's character. God's character is full of kindness and love. And God's activity? He saved us. He showed mercy. He gave us eternal life through Jesus. What is our response then? What is our response? Verse 8. I want you to insist on these teachings so that all who trust in God will devote themselves to doing good. These teachings are good and beneficial for everyone. So we have grace. Not right, our righteousness is not enough. It's our, His grace that saves us. But in response to His grace, He wants us to do good. What is good? Well, the context gives a little bit of meaning. I mean, for instance, you know, it, the, like the institution of slavery is not good. However, in verse 2, he says, Paul, he says, you know, uh, give yourself over to your masters, obey them, to be trustworthy. He's telling his slaves to be trustworthy. Paul gives more instruction regarding living our lives, especially in the context we find ourselves. So listen to the context that the church in Crete is in. Titus 1, 12 through 14. <laughs> These are not kind words regarding the people of Crete. Even one of their own men, a prophet from Crete, has said about them, the people of Crete are all liars, cruel animals, and lazy gluttons. This is true. So reprimand them sternly to make them strong in the faith. They must stop listening to Jewish myths and the commands of people who have turned away from the truth. See, people had a hard time <coughs> This, making a distinction between following Christ and following Jesus and, and still dab, the word is dabbling, still kind of engaging, being a part of their culture there. And he's, the context was, no, you need to make yourself distinct. And he gives instructions around how to make yourself distinct. You can see the writer from Crete was complaining that uh, the lines between, between truth and and lies was blurred. It was very difficult to see. Everyone was looking out just for themselves. Does this sound familiar at all? The lies between, you know, the truth and lies are blurred. More and more lies are being presented as truth. And truth is claimed to be lies. Titus 2, 2 through 7. Teach the older men to exercise self-control, to be worthy of respect, and to live wisely. They must have sound faith and be filled with love and patience. Similarly, teach the older women to live in a way that honors God. They must not slander others or be heavy drinkers. Instead, they should teach others what is good. These older women must train the younger women to love their husbands and their children, to live wisely and be pure, to work in their homes, to do good, and to be submissive to their husbands. Then they will not bring shame on the word of God. In the same way, encourage the young men to live wisely. And you yourself must be an example to them by doing good works of every kind. Let everything you do reflect the integrity and seriousness of your teaching. Now, Paul's offering a summary here. He talks about marriages and submission and, and other uh, letters that he's written. But he's offering a summary about 
the lives that we have, they should reflect the one we follow. The homes and lives of many of the Christians in, in Crete have become a wreck. They were a wreck because they were listening to the lies of those false teachers. The Christians, and here's the problem, the Christians in Crete discredited the message of Jesus because of their lives and their lifestyles. Very concerning to Paul. And the non-Christians could rightly ask, what difference does it make to follow Jesus? What's the difference? It was, a, it was an honest question. It was a good question. See, our aspiration is to maintain our faith and live according to the truth. Very simple. Our aspiration is to maintain our faith and live according to the truth. Simple to say, sometimes difficult to live out. When we aspire to do those things, other opportunities pre present themselves. And that, that really is kind of the, how would I put it, the pinnacle, the, the crux of my message. If you live according to faith and the simple truths, other things will begin to happen. We don't need to aspire for other things. These are the things that we work on and we aspire towards. And God will allow other things to happen and give us other opportunities. If we chase other opportunities without doing these things, we will detour off course and have a very rough path. And people will ask, what difference does it make that they follow Jesus? Titus 1, 6 through 9. An elder, I'm, I'm going to just, I'm, I'm kind of going back. I'm starting at what he says about the truth. And I'm, I'm working my way backwards, okay? And so we're back to when he, he opened with uh, Titus uh, 6 through 9 in uh, chapter 1. An elder must live a blameless life. He must be faithful to his wife and his children. He must be believers who don't have a reputation for being wild or rebellious. A church leader is a manager of God's household, so he must live a blameless life. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered. He must not be a heavy drinker, violent, or dishonest with money. Rather, he must enjoy having guests in his home. Interesting. And he must love what is good. He must live wisely and be just. He must live a devout and disciplined life. He must have a strong belief in the trustworthy message he was taught. Then he will be able to encourage others with wholesome teaching and show those who oppose it where they are wrong. My observation is far too often people aspire to be leaders or elders rather than followers of Christ. We get it backwards. We think honor goes to a leader. But in God's kingdom, he says it again and again, honor goes to the one whose character is based on truth. Regardless of their role. Because it's graduation time and actually because, you know, we're saying goodbye uh, to the box, I know Donna's leaving, and Wesley. We get we get Wesley for a little while longer, but I, especially for the graduates and those that I don't get to speak into anymore. Uh, I, I, th these words are for you, but they're for everybody. Seek to live honorably. Seek to respect others, whether they deserve it or not. There will not be a need to position yourself if you do these things. Instead, if you engage, if you initiate, if you make the first move that's initiate, to show respect. And if you truly respect, it means you have recognized and understood the value of each person being. You recognize them as God sees them. 
We're called to see people, every individual, as God has seen them. And the value that God has seen them. When we see the power and importance of God's truth and the value of his people, I will tell you, as leaders, we sense weight. We sense weight. We feel the sense of weight. When we value as, pe as God values his people. In fact, for me, my own wisdom tells me to avoid such a responsibility to be a leader. It hasn't been my aspiration. My aspiration has to live, been to live faithfully and according to the truth. And then God puts me in places where he chooses to use me. And the same goes for each one of you. Do these things. Don't chase after leadership, especially talking to young people. Don't chase after those things. Chase after truth and faith in him and respect others, valuing others as God values, and God will elevate you. If you really believe what it says in the Bible, that's what you do, because that's what the Bible says to do. And there, but understand, there's weight that comes with that. If you choose to gain leadership through your strength of personality or by positioning self, you will arrive, but you will damage people along the way. And trust me, even me, I have damaged people along the way. Unintentionally, but as a part of being a leader. God uses humans. I am thankful, though, that most of us are not seeking to elevate ourselves. Instead, you're seeking to develop your character, and that's important, develop your character. Um, those of you in this room that are doing that are going to be surprised by opportunities. And if someone asks you to do something, you probably can say yes. Okay? Understood? You probably can say yes. Because they see a character in you. It's not about skill level. It's character and the gifting of and the skill will come. Having faith and a desire for truth is really what qualifies us as church leaders. Do not get seduced by a magnetic personality. And finally, uh, you know, having opinions is easy, making decisions on behalf of others is difficult, but necessary. If you're a respecter of God, and his people, he will be with you. Last thing. Why do good? Why do good? Well, for the slaves, he says in uh, verse 10 of uh, chapter 2, then they will make the teaching about God our Savior attractive in every way. Do you believe you can affect your culture? I hope you do. Because it's the model you present that creates change. And understand this, it happens on a small scale. It's not the big stuff, it's the small stuff, small scale. One by one, person to person. You know, during our time in Kiev, uh, when we first got there, I remember in uh, the metro station, how many have ridden the metro in Kiev, the subway in Kiev, okay? You know, they got those heavy doors, you push those doors and they got springs on them that if you're, I mean, even me, it'll knock me to the ground if I'm not careful. And we noticed that no one seemed, to, when we first got there, no one seemed to care when they, they come crashing through the door if someone's behind them or not. You get hit. Uh, Mary and I made a point of holding the door if someone's behind us. Or even waiting a few seconds. We, even if they have to wait a few seconds, we'd hold the door. And we noticed other people started doing that. Now, Mary and I, I don't think we can we can single-handedly say we've helped create change in a city of four million people. <laughs> All right, 
we'd like to think so, but we did, we didn't, okay? But we observed others would do the same. Others were doing it. There was something about that for whatever time, for whatever reason, at the time we were there, that people were going, this isn't right. And they started holding the doors and waiting. And you think, I, oh, this is my imagination. I will tell you that it was interesting. Some of the uh, websites, the news sites, actually made note of this. People are holding the doors of the metro. <laughs> One by one, one by one, we create change. Then they will make the teaching about our God attractive in every way. The Christians in Crete lived in a difficult culture. Paul was reminding the church that the redemptive power of Jesus needed to be shown to the larger community. The world already knows all the rituals, all the things we, they know about religiosity, they know about going to church, that we sing, they know these things. But they want to see and respond to is a heart change. It's easy to respect most of you. <laughs> I gotta qualify it, I mean, you know, it's, uh, otherwise, I mean, you, never mind. Um, <laughs> It's harder to respect that clerk that screws up or is rude to me at number one. It's harder for me not to roll my eyes and go, oh, come on. But that's what I'm called to do. It sounds ridiculous, silly, but it's not. We respect everybody. That's what the church, that's what the world sees. Our lives make a mark because of the new character generated within us. Paul was telling the church, look, you gotta engage the community. You, you have to present something different. Otherwise, you're just like everybody else. You have to present something different. See, we won't change the world and, and we, through militant, angry activism. That doesn't work. But it's just as wrong for us to hide ourselves and just become our little club. Specific behaviors, doing good, why do we do that? Is so that the world takes notice. Why do our marriages survive? Because of the truths that we follow. Why are our lives in order? Because of the truths that we follow. If you want to be heard, you need to speak with your life. Amen.